Hi there. Yay. Oh, I touched it. I am super excited to tell you about one of my favorite military veterans, a singularly American tale of rags to riches, a plucky, charismatic little orphan who came from nothing and rose through the ranks with, with uh, heroism and sassiness and became a national icon, a celebrity, uh, and the most decorated dog of World War I and subsequently the most famous dog in, U in the US at this time. So uh, a little bit of history. Uh, the, uh, Europe had started fighting a conflict that would become known as uh, the Great War or World War I because spoilers, they hadn't settled their shit for 20 years and had a redo. Uh, and in, uh, but America did not, or the US did not enter the conflict until 1917, three years later. So, and that is also when our hero first enters the history. So it all started on a balmy summer day on, at, the Yale, at the Yale Yard in New Haven, Connecticut in 1917. So at this time, a bunch of men were doing their basic training, getting ready to ship out, and a stray dog started hanging around them. It was a very modest, homely animal. How dare you look shame a dog. Uh, but unremarkable and uh, begging for scraps. So uh, no one took notice of them. It was just kind of this little weird looking dog, kind of bigger than a Boston Terrier, but a little smaller than a pit bull. But one man, Cadet J. Robert Conroy, noticed this little mutt, this small, stocky-bodied, brindle and white-nosed pup with short, stumpy legs and an even shorter, stumpier tail, such that Conroy started calling him Stubby. So Conroy took in this little street mutt as a pet, and he kept him in the training bar barracks where the dog was absolutely doted on by the other trainees. And during drills, Stubby would follow them throughout the Yale yard, and he picked up tricks really quickly. He learned to follow uh, ranks, he learned to follow drills, and uh, he even, under Conroy's tutelage, he even learned to sit up on his haunches and raise his right paw in salute. <laughs> Such a good dog. Now things are about to heat up for Stubby. After months of training at Yale, the unit was ready to ship out to France. However, the US Army uh, still prohibits soldiers from taking pets to the front line. So how would Conway get, or Conroy get Stubby aboard the ship to France? Well, there are two stories. One, he simply stuffed little Stubby into his army-issued greatcoat and nonchalantly boarded the ship. The second ver version of the story is that he was in cahoots with a crewman who agreed to wrap Stubby in a blanket and nonchalantly carry Stubby wrapped in a blanket onto the USS Minnesota. Once aboard, Conroy secreted the little stowaway into the ship's coal bin. And throughout the voyage, Conway and the other men of the 102nd, they visited, they fed, they played with Stubby, until one day they were discovered in the coal room by a superior officer. Dun, dun, dun. Now, at this moment, maybe Stubby knew that he was in hot water, or maybe Conroy gave him the signal, but just as the CO was about to raise hell, Stubby obediently sat up on his haunches and raised his right paw in salute. What a good dog. Needless to say, I'm sure the commander was just obliterated by the cuteness of this moment. And it was like, this dog can come to the front lines, absolutely. And they made it to France without further incident. Now, over the course of his military career, he served eight months in France, and this is in the front lines. This dog is in the trenches under constant fire, shelling, gas attacks, and yet at the same time, he's providing comfort and an incredible morale boost to the doughboys of the 102nd. Now, he did so much that I'm gonna try and group his deeds of heroism into, into a few categories. But not only did he brave the horrors of trench warfare, but he saved numerous lives. So let me regale you with his tales of heroism. First of all, he was incredibly loyal to the men in his unit. He very quickly learned to distinguish English voices from German voices. So after battles, he would run out and listen for English 
and he would locate disoriented or wounded or blinded soldiers and help lead them back behind the trenches. Or if men were mo wounded, he'd go out and stay by them and bark until medics arrived. What a good dog, right? Now, he also was uh, excellent with early detection. With his sharp canine senses, he could hear artillery shells incoming well before the humans could. So he would bark and just basically freak out and alert everyone that there was incoming fire and they could take cover with the advanced warning. Now, I'd also like to take a brief aside to um, talk about how absolutely awful mustard gas is. So this chemical agent was first used in World War I and it is a vesicant, which means that it causes blisters, and it absolutely incapacitates its, its victims. And even worse, it takes 12 to 24 hours for the symptoms to show up. So you're out in the front lines, you're like, hmm, I smell something spicy. Well, I'm fine. And then uh, a day later, suddenly you have excruciatingly painful pus-filled blisters all over your skin. And even worse, mustard gas strips the, membus, the uh, mucous membrane, so it does pretty horrific things to your eyes, your sinus tract, and your digestive system. And I will not be showing you pictures. You're welcome. <laughs> now I mention this because very early, in one of his first battles, Stubby the dog and the men were exposed to mustard gas, and they all were horribly incapacitated and had to be sent back uh, behind to a, a hospital to recover. And even while recovering from one of the most awful chemical agents, <laughs> Stubby just remained this upbeat little happy dog and was just the absolute joy to the division and a great comfort to the other wounded soldiers. So he was such a good dog. As soon as he recovered, he was sent right back up to the front lines in the trenches. However, he was issued his own canine gas mask. <laughs> Unfortunately, due to the odd, lumpy shape of his head, a proper fit could never be achieved. Yet, our little hero knew what mustard gas smelled like, and he knew he did not like it. So he was able to detect incredibly low concentrations of gas and would bark furiously whenever he smelled it from far, far away. So he was able to alert his unit to incoming attacks uh, very quickly. Now, in another great act of heroism, the, uh, the 102nd Division and the 26th, they combined forces and they liberated a town in France in, the, in a big offensive. And uh, of course, Stubby was part of that. And the women of the village were so grateful to their heroes that they sewed him a special war vest. They made him a little, I know, too cute. So throughout the war, through every successive battle, he would continue to earn medals and ranks and gifts that all got pinned to his little war vest that he wore throughout the, whale, throughout the war. Such a good dog. Now finally, he even captured some enemy combatants. Now, the story goes that one day Stubby discovered a German scout and the German soldier tried to shoo him away. And upon hearing the German, he flipped the fuck out and started biting the soldier, uh, got, got a good bite in on his leg, knocked him over, and just stayed there biting and keeping him down until other soldiers could, uh, could come and arrest him and take him away. And in another much retold and possibly very exaggerated story, Stubby supposedly caught a German spy by the seat of the pants and thus incapacitated him until the rest of the 102nd could arrive. <laughs> Now, this may not have exactly happened like this, but he did capture a German spy, and when the spy was arrested, they, the, the Americans, because they were kind of jerks, they, they took his iron cross and they gave it to Stubby, which you can see here, right on the patoot. <laughs> now, stories of this brave wee little mutt caught traction, and the newspapers absolutely loved it, and they were telling these inflated, hyperbolic stories about Stubby's heroism and valor and his medals and his rank, and details from these articles are highly contradictory. We do know that he did earn two uh, wound stripes from, from uh, shell fire and from uh, a grenade attack, but the newspapers disagree on like what part of his body or where it happened, uh, and often gave him just wildly, vastly different accounts, offering, often exaggerating his exploits to mythic proportions. Now, through all, throughout it all, uh, Conroy kept a scrap boy of all of Stubby's press, but not everyone was a fan. 
one veteran wrote in to an, or wrote in an editorial, if this Boston Bull did so much and the boys didn't do anything, why not send an army of bull pups the next time and see who is entitled to these honors? The thousands of real heroes, the red-blooded American boys who left gallons of their blood and maybe an arm and a leg on the battlefields don't get these honors bestowed on them. They didn't do anything to receive a medal for the name a real hero, but a dog did. Now, the detractors did have a point. At this point in history, the Great War was the deadliest conflict to date, with over 20 million deaths and 23 million injuries. And despite the atrocities of trench warfare, the newspapers are touting these cutesy feel-good stories about an adorable scrappy mutt pants and those huns. Now, was the, uh, was the media sensationalizing Stubby as a, as a deliberate effort to sugarcoat the devastation of war? Or was Stubby more organically rocketing to fame by providing this sorely needed rallying point for wounded American patriotism? Maybe he was just the symbol that the nation needed to, to come together and feel good about something in this awful war. Either way, Stubby, uh, next to this entry, Conway left a handwritten note saying, criticism of Stubby, which proves he is famous. <laughs> and it was undeniable. Stubby was a celebrity. And through all, throughout it all, Conroy was a dutiful promoter of his canine companion and never sought the limelight himself. And perhaps Stubby's public persona was a transference of Conway's own, more private heroism, because the two were inseparable. In 1818, when the war ended, Stubby was still top dog, and his reputation as a national hero endured. Uh, he came home and he led parades, he appeared uh, at the theater, he did vaudeville appearances, special charity appearances, political rallies, and he got medal after medal after accolade. Uh, his paw was shaken by three different active presidents. <laughs> he got a lifetime uh, membership to the YMCA, plus a guarantee of three bones a day for being a good dog, a purple heart, and the American Red Cross issued him a special parade harness so he could lead parades holding a tiny American flag aloft. <laughs> Not only that, the highest ranking member of the US Army, this is a rank that has only held, been held by one living person, John J. Pershing, issued him a Medal of Valor. Stubby's portrait was captured by a uh, national portraiture artist, Whipple, who I do not think knows how to paint dogs. <laughs> And throughout his life, he just had continued public, experience, uh, uh, public appearances, presiding over parades and events, and just everyone just lost their mind because he was so cute. <laughs> Such a good dog. And he just continually upstaged everyone around him. <laughs> and attention and spotlight, Conroy wanted to focus on his career and he eventually enrolled in Georgetown University and quietly pursued a degree in law. And meanwhile, Stubby uh, stayed in the spotlight and became the Georgetown U mascot, uh, where he was elevated to Stubby BS MA PhD. And <laughs> at halftime shows, he was trained to nudge a football across the field while thousands of people lost their minds. <laughs> Now, all things do come in, to an end, and after a long, happy life with his supporter, Conroy, uh, Conroy eventually pursued a, uh, a government career in DC and took Stubby with him, and Stubby was absolutely a good boy to the end, and in March 16th, 1926, he passed away in Conroy's arms. Now, he, he had a long life. He was a long, happy, long, happy, happy life. Now, little is known about Conroy's life after Stubby, because Stubby was, was the national hero. Uh, but we do know from his, from his children and his grandchildren that he never had another dog. And why would he? Because he had the best dog. <laughs> so I would like to raise a toast to scrappy underdogs everywhere and to being a very, very, very good dog. That was awesome. <laughs> Look, if I'm curating, there's a dog story. Um, thank you so much, Insulton. <laughs> Look at his little face. <laughs> I, I 
Oh, shit, I'm losing my shit over here. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna keep it together, I promise. Okay, all right, all right, all right, you're all still here. You're all there with Sarn. What would Stubby do? He would be so excited for this last talk. I'm sorry, think of Stubby. Okay, all right. Okay. Also the best title of any talk ever. Um, please, for our, for our last talk, we are bringing it local, uh, and we're bringing it to a very important time in San Francisco history. So please, a very warm welcome uh, for our very own Michael Salazzo to talk about dropping it like it's botany. <laughs> Hello, oddlings. Let's see. Hello. Hi, Mike. All right, so tonight I get to share with you the extraordinary life of Alice Eastwood. She is a teacher, a hiker, a botanist, a badass, a hero, and a Canadian. <laughs> Alice was born in Toronto in 1859. She had an older brother, she had a younger sister, and unfortunately, at the age of six, her mother passed away. So uh, at that time, um, her father went to look for work uh, and sent the kids off to a physician uncle uh, to live. And while there, um, you know, they didn't have a lot of money, uh, but Alice started to learn about gardening from her uncle, who it was a passion of his. Uh, and so this started this kind of lifelong passion with nature. Um, but what ended up happening then, after two years, the physician was like, hey, you and your sister need to go to a convent. So, <laughs> as you do. Um, but the brother got to stay, and that, we're just not gonna talk about him anymore. So, <laughs> Alice and the sister go to a convent, and Alice is befriended by a priest there who knows some of the scientific names about plants. And so there's this theme that just keeps going in Alice's life where she meets these people who introduce to her the love of nature and love of plants. Uh, and you know she didn't have a lot of money, uh, but it never affected her. Alice had this buoyant personality, and everyone loved her, and this was pretty much throughout her entire life. Also, uh, because this is Canada, went to look for work, meant went to look for work. Um, <laughs> and eight years later, her dad comes back and gets the family and moves them to a small mountain town of Denver, Colorado. Yeah, this is a happy story, actually. Um, so, Alice is now in Denver, Colorado. Uh, she is now in, in school, uh, in a local high school, and uh, she eventually graduates as valedictorian, but during this time, she's also working to help the family out. She's a seamstress, uh, she's taken a job as a nanny, and as a nanny, she gets to go around the mountains of, of Denver and you know, with, with the kids and the family she's with and start learning everything about the local flora. So this is ideal for her. Uh, she also, after graduating valedictorian, begins teaching at the local high school and is this kind of self-taught botanist. She gets such an amazing reputation for both being an indefatigable hiker and an incredibly knowledgeable botanist that when a famed naturalist Alfred Russell Wallace visits in 1887, when she's just 28, she is the person to take him on a hike around Gray's Peak. 